Okay, so I think we're, we're good to, to start and we'll still continue to accept people as they join. Um, donc, bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Merci d'être avec nous pour cet événement en ligne qui a été conçu en réponse aux expositions présentées actuellement à la Fonderie d'Arling. Euh, Puisqu'il ne reste qu'une semaine pour les visiter, nous avons souhaité approfondir certains enjeux communs aux pratiques de Dan S. Wang et Michael Eddy euh, afin de poursuivre avec vous un échange artistique et amical qui a débuté entre les deux artistes il y a déjà plusieurs années. Donc, je me présente, je m'appelle Milia Alexandra Derry, je travaille comme adjointe à la programmation à la Fonderie et il me fait plaisir d'être avec vous ce soir pour cette conversation qui se déroulera en anglais euh, pour une durée d'environ 45 minutes et qui sera suivie d'une période de questions. So good evening, everyone. As I was saying, we are very happy to present this conversation between artists Danes Wang and Michael Eddy uh, around works shown in their respective exhibitions at Fondry Darling. Uh, as there is one week left to visit the exhibitions, we thought this event would be ideal to talk about certain issues that are common to Dan and Michael's practices and to continue with you an artistic and friendly exchange that began between artists several years ago. My name is Mili Alexandra Derry. I work as program assistant at Fondry Darling. Uh, before introducing Dan and Michael and passing over to them, I would like to acknowledge that we are recording this event from the traditional and ceded territory of the Kanyan Gehaga Nation. Uh, we recognize and respect uh, continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples in the Jojage Montreal community. So, Michael, hello. I think you need to unmute. I thought we were all wearing um, our, our printing uniform. <laughs> you thought then, it was a creative workshop? Well, Dan and I had this plan to both be in our printing <laughs> uniforms. But I don't know. It's Forgot my apron. Typical. I'll go get mine. But first, I'll introduce you, all right? So, Michael, thank you for being here. Uh, you're an artist, a writer, a curator, and throughout the years, your practice has taken many forms in collective and individual configurations. Uh, you are based in Montreal and occupy one of the Montreal studio at the Darling Foundry, uh, and you do until 2022. Uh, Je suis is your first dedicated solo exhibition in Canada, and while preparing the exhibition, you had the idea to invite Dan, whom you knew from a previous collaboration, uh, to present his printed work uh, on the reading platform. So thank you for, for being here. It's really a, a pleasure to have you both. Uh, Dan, uh, hello as well. Uh, you are an artist, a writer, and organizer currently living in Los, in Los Angeles, California. Uh, as you can see for you, it's, for, it's rather the afternoon time. Hi, Dan. Hello. Uh, you also have worked on several coll uh, collaborative and experimental projects, uh, and you have lectured internationally on topics having to do with new geographies of power, art activism, and the contra contradictory cultural politics of race and identity. Uh, the installation, a range of overstone grammars presented on our, on our reading platform, uh, presents a mix of prints, posters, cards, stickers, uh, bookmarks, a selection from a 20-year survey of printed work, uh, Mary, many wearing the, the preposition press imprint, uh, the name of the basement printing office you assembled in the 90s in Chicago. So thank you for accepting the invitation. You're welcome. Uh, to start this conversation, I was thinking maybe we could go uh, dive right, it, right it into uh, telling us more about how you two met and what was the context of your first collaboration? Well, <clears throat> can you hear that music? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay. Should I close the window? It's okay. I think uh, it's can well, I was, I was living in, uh, in Beijing from 2008 to 2013. And 
Um, one of the projects that I took part in was um, called Home Shop. It was a collective. I'm going to close the window just a second. It was a collectively organized uh, space in a, in a group um, in central Beijing. And at one point, and Dan and I were trying to figure out where the origin was, but uh, we didn't quite locate it. But uh, Dan and a whole group of collaborators came over to work with Home Shop and um, on this, if this kind of radical tourism, I guess you could say, uh, trip that started in Beijing and, and went south in China to, uh, that, and Dan can probably explain. We met. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just say that, uh, <clears throat> so, that was uh, for, for uh, at least from my side of it, um, myself and a group of a kind of a loose, uh, loose group of uh, uh, collaborators um, who'd been working together in different configurations for a few years um, and uh, who had um, we'd kind of been involved in this kind of like cooperative research. Um, you know, a bunch of us were artists and writers. Uh, and we were all, you know, activists and organizers and uh, wanting to um, go a little bit, um, just gather more knowledge for ourselves um, to inform our organizing about uh, where it was that we, we were living at the time, which was in the Great Lakes uh, region of the United States. And um, a number of us through different, through different pathways um, had this interest in uh, in the China in the China context. Um, uh, one of the main reasons being that the deindustrialization of the, of the American heartland was uh, so much um, tied to the uh, the economic development um, ha happening in China. I mean, there were so many specific companies and specific products that were, um, you know, the manufacturing of which had, had moved directly from the United States to different parts of China. Um, so that was one of the, one of the sort of like cons concept kind of intellectual, you know, uh, reasons for engaging. And then um, from that point, it, it becomes, well, you know, the, for people not Americans who are maybe not familiar with China. It's so, it's such an overwhelming, um, such a daunting kind of context uh, within which to even just to travel, you know. Um, so it became a question of like, who, who can we find in China to, to, to collaborate with, to who can help uh, facilitate um, our coming over and uh, uh, getting into um, the, the sort of different angles by which to um, uh, absorb, observe, take in what was going on in China. Um, so that, that all led up to this uh, meeting in 2011. Uh, and it happened that, uh, you know, there were, it turned out there were many um, kind of interesting uh, parallel ways of working among all of us artists. Um, and reasons to continue, you know, ongoing conversations. Um, so that's kind of some of the background there. And maybe I'll just say, uh, Home Shop, uh, why it was relevant for us was because we were using the space in which, uh, in the center of the city, to as a base to kind of explore the neighborhood uh, and the the changes happening in central Beijing, which is very old uh, and had gone through many generations, but was, was being wiped out uh, by, by uh, new building projects and, and things. So, in, uh, so it, we, we were that kind of spirit of exploration as, as a, 
collective activity was very much a part of what we were doing also. Um, and, and also one of the important reasons to make that space, it wasn't my idea to found, it was uh, initiated by a group of other people in, in 2008, uh, including Elaine Ho and uh, Fotini Lazaridu Hatsigoga and uh, Ouyang Xiao. There's kind of different origin stories of that space, but when it moved into a bigger space and there were more organizers. And I think one of the purposes for working together was because there wasn't in, in Beijing a lot of um, work that we felt we could connect to uh, critical types of artwork uh, is very dominated by a gallery context. And that's another, another connection, um, trying to found spaces, kind of public spaces. In our case, it was public space by necessity in private space. Uh, but I think, for example, um, Dan had been a big part of founding a space in Chicago? Yes. Chicago yeah. called Mess Hall from um, two, 2010, no, to 2013? Uh, uh, 2000, 2003 until uh, 2013. So it went for 10 years. Very long, yeah. Um, but yeah, you're, 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 you're totally right. And, and I'll just point out, like say in the, in the, the slide of the McDonald's um, that you see on, that people are looking at on the screen, there's a woman in the center there with a short hair and her her hand up on her face, um, and that that is uh, a woman. Um, her name is um, uh, Ula Ula Schneider, and she 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 joined this group and this uh, gathering from uh, Vienna, Austria, and um, you know I knew her through uh, these other circuits, um, these European circuits where she was you know involved. She's very much involved in some really interesting artist run kinds of um, initiatives there. So there was a sort of like global, you know, um, uh, I mean, it was, it, yeah, it was, it was, it was, you know, it was this kind of, kind of global thing of uh, people um, finding each other through these different circuits, uh, all sort of, you know, underneath that, what Michael talked about, the, the sort of like, um, high visibility gallery driven kind of art world. Um, but you know, here was this kind of like, uh, uh, more of a sort of a DIY less, far less commercial or not commercial at all kind of, um, circuits that, um, um, were in some ways connected or, uh, understandable, um, in, in the terms of those, those other global art circuits so uh yeah it was it was interesting that way just to just just not only the context of beijing but also just this sort of like meeting of different people from all these different contexts um and actually i th i thought uh one of the things that i because we were sort of like the on the ground organizers of that trip i felt like ah uh, we have to find something that explains globalization for, for this group like but actually Beijing is not a manufacturing center really so it uh, we didn't have much to show in that sense but um, but what was produced through our kind of collaboration was this feeling of, a, of that network the shared network that you mentioned and I think even uh, one of the the participants, Claire, who has the, the camera in the, in the picture there, she used the term um, networks of validation. So you kind of get a sense, ah, there's some sort of value, <laughs> even though uh, it's, a, it's quite low visibility in some ways, this DIY art uh, space um, ecosystem. Um, we get, uh, you know, a sort of, mutually supported um, sense of value 
And how many of you were working together, for instance, in Home Shop at that period? Was it like just to have a sense of scale? Of yeah, it was, many? it was a shop front space and with three studios, common kitchen, common courtyard, and then a, a, a work share room where people could rent desks. So there were different levels of engagement and um, some of it was to support the space. Uh, at that time, there wasn't so much this work share uh, trend that is totally, you know, professionalized much more now with uh, that we work in all this giant glass buildings. But at that time, there were not that many options aside from cafes in, in Beijing. So that was the kind of business concept behind the, the space. But among the organizers, it fluctuated, but it was around seven um, people. And I'd say about half uh, foreigners and half local Chinese. And, and we seemed, went the, the, on this trip. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to talk about the use of print and printmaking uh, in, in home shop and in these uh, DIY social and collaborative uh, structures. Maybe I, I'm curious to know how, why and how uh, this, the, these techniques and medium came so important in, in the works you produced from that period. Well, both you I mean, and, and them. The funny thing about uh, China, if, we, if we're talking in this kind of vocabulary of DIY spaces and, I, I mean, I, yeah, that this, I wouldn't say anarchist necessarily because that there's much more hardcore people than me out there, but um, the whole topic of zine culture, for example, and like self-publishing, was not, it didn't, there's not much evidence of it in comparison to over here because they, they jumped right into digital formats uh, pretty quickly after it, uh, you know, opened up a bit more. Uh, someone who knows more could certainly correct me about that. I'm sure there's amazing zines. Um, but printing, therefore, actually printing things uh, was, was a very social type of activity in that sense. Um, and also, uh, there were designers among the, the organizers who loved making books and um, Jesus Christ. Um, and the designers, that really actually changed the way I thought about uh, making books and, and print and, and writing too. Mm -hmm. uh, it opened a lot for me to, to work with these people who had this practice of uh, producing publications. Uh, in China also, it's much more, it's much easier to print because you're, it's not so cost prohibitive. You, you can go to the print factories, you can, you can make an edition of, of 500 books or something for much less than you can here. So it's sort of an activity that is semi-sustainable, but even for, if you're independent, um, however, uh, the circulation is is uh, obviously something that a lot of people wanting to make books don't think about, but it's it's the actually the hardest part. But so there were those kind of there's like the discursive and and the more kind of performative sides of printing, which I think I'll talk about a, a bit after um, after Dan describes his printing, I think. Well, I'll just say, so this is, this is kind of all to say that Michael and I did not know each other, about each other's like studio practice, um, really at all. Um, so then, so it's like years later now, uh, having this opportunity to do this together, um, uh, even, even, even uh, interrupted as it was by the pandemic, 
Um, it was, uh, you know, a kind of interesting way to uh, re-engage this conversation, um, but, you know, through our artworks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe then uh, here we can see a, a picture of you working. Sure. Maybe you can tell us a little about your practice and uh, that ray that has that has such a wonderful range from very experimental to very utilitarian uh, prints. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I was. I mean, the basic kind of story is that I was. I was. You know, I was trained as a a printmaker and and just as a. a a uh, young person, I was, you know, I was, dr I was drawn to graphic work, and um, because I was um, from the beginning a writer uh, as well as a, a studio artist, um, there was a sort of natural meeting point of those two ways of thinking um, in, you know, right what maybe people would call text art or 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 just what I what I just think of as typography, um, you know, visual visual presentation of of language. Um, there's a little bit of, you know, um, my own sort of personal kind of history growing up in a, in a house full of Chinese art and paintings and, you know, in so many traditional Chinese uh, painting forms and genres. It's, you know, the, the, the literary and the visual are, are kind of co collided together in these conventional ways. Um, so I kind of always have thought has, I've always thought of like language as a visual thing. Um, and uh, then in, uh, when I was in school, uh, you know, I became interested in letterpress. This was in Milwaukee. And uh, at, you know, that part of the country, the, the, the Great Lakes part of the country, a lot of the um, printing equipment of the 20th century was made around there. So in the 90s, it wasn't that difficult to find to, to if I, you know, if, you, if one wanted to start to accumulate it. Um, or I should say it was kind of like the beginning of the end of the era in, in which like it was not so hard to find that, that, that equipment. Um, so that's what I did. You know, I invested in, I hunted, I hunted down, you know, a couple of presses and, and type and, 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 and those kinds of, uh, the, all the things you would need for a small working shop. Um, and that became, you know, what I had to work with. So that explains why you see here on this wall over the years of, of making these um, posters and prints, um, they all look different, but they all kind of, there's also similarities because mm -hmm. it has, has to do with, you know, just what kind of type I had. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll fast forward to sort of the end, game, end stage of this whole part of my, my artistic life, which is to say that uh, in the beginning, I also felt uh, from a kind of like ethics side of it um, in sort of a, you know, conceptual slash ethics side of it. I was drawn to this stuff because I was, I was interested in, in helping to preserve it. And I was, I was interested in um, uh, investing my own, uh, you know, kind of hands, my own hands with the, the craft knowledge um, just, just to, uh, just so it wouldn't go extinct. Um, and by the time, uh, like a few years ago, or even like, let's say 10 years ago, um, it became pretty clear to me that it wasn't going go to go extinct. Um, not anytime soon anyways, uh, not with my generation anyways, there's a lot of people who are younger than me who are taking to it. Um, and, uh, a lot of people were, you know, bringing in digital, uh, ways of, uh, of, uh, doing the pre-press part. Um, and that's kind of when I started to lose a little bit of interest. Um, my interest started to wane. Uh, and that all led up to um, the last few years where I did relocated from the Midwest to here, where I am now, Los Angeles. And I decided not to, um, not only to not move all that equipment, which is, as people know, is very heavy, um, but I also made the decision to um, release it release it from myself and uh so i sold it all and i i don't you know i don't i don't use it anymore but uh, that's is that true because you i think you mentioned to me that you are the master printer uh, that still gets a plane ticket once in a while to fly in and and operate it back in uh, chicago 
that's true. That is true. So, so, so I, I, I don't, I don't, this is no longer my own studio practice. Um, but my skills are not, are not going to waste. And, and in fact, I, I, I think, uh, it's really the first time I'm, I'm really being, being paid to, you know, like to, to actually use, use those skills. Um, so that is, that is, that is, that is, that is the, that is the case. Um, but it's no longer mine. You know, I, I, I don't own the stuff anymore. I don't, I don't print for myself. Uh, really. But, the, but Dan, a lot of this, uh, work, it was commissioned or at least like it, was it responding to certain demands or was it all your brain? Yeah. Yeah. Let me explain that. Um, so as Michael said, uh, I was pretty involved in this thing called Mess Hall in Chicago um, for a few years. And that was an example of one of the projects that I, or a part of my work that was like, you know, kind of more, more demanding and, and more, um, I mean, on, on, in terms of time and labor. Uh, and there were, there were other things like that. Um, and also, you know, I was doing, I, I, I did a lot of writing in those years and um and i was teaching um so all of those things kind of added up to um a calendar that would where where i would have all the you know like many artists do you have all of these deadlines that you're constantly juggling or working towards and then in between you, you would finish something and then you have like a, a couple days lull or you know maybe a week um sometimes a couple of weeks before i really had to really, you know, step on the pedal for the next project. Um, and much of this work that you're seeing was how I filled those gaps. Um, that's partly why I never really did any big, you know, like more ambitious book work um, or printing projects that, uh, you know, involved like printing many setting and pr printing many, many layouts and then binding them, um, you know, these things you call books <laughs> right actually um, i thought when when millie asked me do you know any uh small publishers for the the reading platform in the in the small gallery here um i thought of your press propositions press thinking that it was a publishing house because that, that's how little i actually knew about it <laughs> yeah yeah i i mean it's it's funny because you know few of my uh, constant collaborators, they, they do a lot of self-publishing, um, you know, temporary services or Sam Gold, you know, these, these, these people. Um, and that's what they're, they're kind of known for. Um, not letter pressers, um, but uh, uh, kind of the DIY zine culture you talked about, um, the, you, you know, all, all, all the kinds of art practices that, that came out of like sort of like earlier xerography and things like that. Um, uh, but for me, yeah, it was, it was sort of like this, it was really an engagement with the material that I had. So, so none of it is digital. There's nothing digital. It's all analog. It's all hand set. Um, it's all, you know, handwork in that sense. Um, and every one of these compositions became a kind of puzzle that, uh, where, where, wherein you had to fit in the parts and the parts were the letters, you know, the, the pieces of type and the language that I'm trying to express or whatever I'd written out, but then maybe that would have to be altered be, due to. Oh. You, and then, uh, you froze. The great, the great LA firewall has frozen you in, in time. The, the city of Crystal has claimed you. We lost you for for a second here, Dan. Um, but it makes me think, Michael. Maybe we can continue while we wait for Dan to be. <laughs> I wanted to, to say unfrozen. just that his his uh, like when we received the package of these uh, that when he says handwork, it's also unfortunate that uh, people can't touch them because they're so uh, they're so tactile there's mm. the effects of the printing on them the paper is each one is different and and uh, i really felt like uh i had little i don't know 
jewels in my hands when when I was uh, first opening the box. Mm. What were you saying, Dan? Uh, am I back? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, I was. I was just saying that uh, you know each 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 one of those was a kind of design problem that was a bit of a puzzle where you know it's a uh, having to fit in the parts, the parts being the language that I wanted to write or that I had written, um, that I wanted to print, and then the material of how much, how much, how much I have, um, and that goes for that goes for the paper as well. So uh, 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 when I collected uh, much of this equipment, um, a lot of times it was people, hobby printers or small shops around Chicago. Um, and they had, um, you know, a lot of stuff, uh, inks and type, and 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 I would just take whatever was available, um, and that included a lot of vintage paper, a um, lot of odd kind of end pieces or um, different kinds of paper that they don't make anymore. Um, so uh, that would determine like the edition sizes. So a lot of these edition sizes are not that big. Uh, maybe between 20 and 50, um, which becomes another problem or issue of like question of like, you know, how precious are any of these? Uh, if you have 20, uh, you know, you kind of start to think about where they're going to go. Um, 50, you know, you don't have to be as careful about, but uh, it's all less than 100. Most of it's less than 100. Uh, so it's m kind of micro scaled in that in that sense, um, which you know, don't quite see in the display here, but that's that's part of the work. That's that was sort of the whole um, part of the whole production story. Hmm. And I'm curious because um, um, Michael, you were familiar with Dan's printing practice uh, before the exhibition, but then you were you were telling us that you weren't so familiar with Michael's own printing. Uh, like prints and styrofoam and grain engraving works. Uh, so maybe Michael, I don't know, maybe you could jump in and talk a little bit about how you first started with uh, printing, maybe more as a performative activity with the papers and uh, the work you did with Home Shop and how it uh, led to the, the production of images um, later on. So I'll just give a couple examples. Um, when we first uh, started working together at Home Shop, um, the idea of a, of a we, we played with the idea of a, could you actually show the next? Yep. The next slide. Okay, so this is earlier than Home Shop. This is before I, I joined, but I was in, in Beijing and um, I was working in the, central business district and i didn't know anybody for the first year and uh, i lived very close to where i worked and it really was completely alienating so i but i noticed that the print shops were open 24 hours and you could go in and there was no time limit there was no um there was no fee for sitting down and basically producing something right there. So that's, that's what I, the, the kind of parameters that I gave myself, I was going to go after work, after dinner, around midnight or something and just stay until uh, I produced a zine. And um, so on, in these zines, it, it, it's using the, also the, all of the kind of other people's stuff that had been left on the desktop or in the hard drives uh, a lot of commercial imagery and um, and also just uh, kind of uh, word processing programs in order to generate the images and i also included like the time when that page was finished that was a, a one of the features on each page um, and so that 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 with that, and we can go to the previous slide, um, the idea of doing it with more people and in, in dialogue with other people, uh, I brought that along with me. And we were producing um, newspapers on site with our own 
silkscreen facility, which was just basically a, a, a fluorescent, a box of fluorescent tubes in a boiler room in order to expose these uh, screen print, these uh, silk screen. Um, and sometimes I think it was just the paper with uh, baby oil on it in order to get, uh, in order to expose the negative uh, on these screens. If people know how screen printing works, it's a, set, a kind of photographic process. Um, so it was very, very rough and, but we could do it right there. And the idea to make a newspaper with contributions from whoever was attending that event at the time. Uh, and it, you could take in a lot of different types of work and, and skills and, and, um, just explore the neighborhood, lay it all out in a file and then um, expose the screen, print it, and finish it all in one day. And that's what, um, we did that a few times. And that sort of process of a, of a, a print or a publication kind of bringing into, uh, like creating an activity, generating a performance in a way, uh, was followed up in this particular example, which is a, uh, we were invited to a group show in another city. And so we didn't necessarily want to just kind of, and it was also in a new development, um, not even in an old uh, pre-existing residential space. It's, it, was, it was quite, you know, there's nothing there, just an empty, 400 houses that hadn't been lived in, but uh, the real estate companies are often the ones who engage contemporary artists uh, in sometimes a, the most, the freest way mm. possible with no strings attached. And so, um, and this was actually organized by a, a, a the art academy in, in Hangzhou. Um, but for this exhibition, we, landed and started to look at all of the other works in the show just a couple days before the show opening as the workers were preparing the, the shows. Most artists didn't go, they just sent work, but we uh, critiqued and made a, a critical newspaper about every work in the show. And um, some of the comments were, uh, pretty nasty, I have to say, <laughs> but uh, it was intended to, to be kind of like a barb or like a, you know, a little, a little snarky. Um, and, and we printed it during the opening too. So, and people paid like 50 cents per copy. So like the, the, the format of publication really marshals all of these, um, these activities and, and uh, yeah. I have seen these, these newspapers and it's, it's interesting to me because I'm more familiar with the, with the styrofoam engraving prints that they, as they are in the small gallery at the Fondry Darling. And um, it seems to me interesting. It seems like you went to newspapers from making the actual cartoons that were, that are in the newspaper. Maybe we can, uh, maybe you can tell us a little about how you came to produce, uh, to, to print the images, like how you transferred to engravings and actual drawing. Um. I, like the history of print uh, for me is like, it's not something that I was approaching really head on here, but um, there's many offshoots uh, and consequences of, of uh, print. Uh, I just found this process. I didn't, I didn't really, I, I don't know. It's sort of just, it just, I found it. <laughs> uh, cutting into styrofoam in order to, to make uh, prints. It's, it's easy and uh, the, 
basically all the styrofoam that I, I found was, uh, was just left on the side of the road. It already had a life. Sometimes you could see that in the prints that there's like, it's not a completely smooth surface. Um, uh, a lot of insulation panels and, and something I haven't explored a lot, but is, is like the architectural connection um, to materials here. But what I liked about this method of printing was that it really um, simplified the picture. And I had a tendency with drawing and uh, to over render things and make be very precious with, with, I took printmaking in university and lithography, I would tend to make like very, you know, shaded things. And, and so I could never actually decide on some picture that I wanted to do because there was so much shading involved and it was a lot of time. And like, uh, it also looked basically like cartoons actually, <laughs> but cartoons that were a bit too precious. Mm. Um, and I didn't, I didn't pursue printmaking uh, after that. I was, um, and so, but that released me from from this preciousness a bit. This this type of imagery, but also the history of print uh, came to mind because it looks like the the reference that I uh, appreciate about this was the medieval woodblock printing that it it resembled to me and how whole kind of social systems or something like morality um, are depicted in like in church prints of people mm -hmm. in hell, for example. Um, another work in this show is uh, a, a video torturing credit cards that I won't get into, but the, this kind of the images of cruelty of, uh, medieval prints really interested me. Um, and also t today, all the discussion about free speech, um, I, I really was interested in Prince's role in that. Um, the first image that you see of, uh, Tom, of uh, Martin Luther, uh, this is not, it's, it's kind of based on some images of Martin Luther, but actually it's, it's from a movie about Martin Luther and uh, Ralph Fiennes is looking over his shoulder while he's naughtily uh, hammering up his 95 theses. Uh, and, and so I was thinking of just through this work, like the, the concept of free expression and its role in today. And, uh, and therefore this, this church, which is not a Catholic church, it's all belief systems. And he's still finding something to complain about uh, and to protest. And that, that, that is sort of like the door into the rest of the, the show. I, I sort of thought of this as a, as a kind of disembodied book taken apart um, and and that's how I, yeah organize the space Dan if ever you have some um, am I am I am on Dan, you want to correct some... the record about Martin Luther <laughs> if you have some interpretations comments uh, please feel free to join in I would okay. also invite uh, people uh, in in the conversation to feel free to ask questions or join if ever you you want to speak you can uh, ask us to unmute you or let your video uh, go in or you can simply write in the chat box if ever you have any questions but otherwise Michael you can go on and continue to reveal some insights about these <laughs> wonderful prints. Oh they're printed on Tyvek that's another uh, just the size of them I couldn't uh, I couldn't figure out how to not make the paper roll up and it was really difficult and I the types of ink and things like this, it took a long time to figure the right mix. So it's a kind of water soluble oil-based ink that worked in this case, and a, and a kind of Tyvek uh, sort of art 
grade Tyvek, which is a plastic. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's just on the material level, that's fun, kind of funny because Tyvek and uh, styrofoam are both, um, right, you, building materials and used to, to create, um, uh, you know, insulation barriers. Mm -hmm. um, so to take the one and print it on the other, that's kind of, that's, that's kind of, well, I mean, you know, you could, we could do the Chinese thing and say it's harmonious somehow, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, the question of the Luther thing, I mean, that, I mean, I, I was intrigued by that one because what, one of my current projects is, um, you know, I, I thought I was going back in time. I've had, had this kind of fixing. Uh, and and one, one of the perspectives or one of the angles at which I've, I've been uh, feeding my obsession with it is understanding it as a, uh, understanding it as a important event in the um, history of, uh, of uh, media uh, and it being this event that was um, played out in uh, pamphlet warring. Uh, in political oratory that the next day would be out on the streets as a printed, in a printed form. Sorry, uh, where, when are you talking about? I'm talking about the French Revolution. So ah, okay. 1790s. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, 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 I was, I, yeah, I was just, that was, that was one of the entry points for me to, to kind of interpret that event or, or, um, think about it, think it through, think and think about what it what it meant to to, you know, for for people who use print media now, especially like analog print media, um, but also just any kind of grassroots print media um, or any kind of self publishing, even digital um, online. Um, but then then I saw this print of yours and see that you're going way back further, you know, another uh, two and a half centuries at least to early 1500s uh, and you know this is Luther came along not long after Gutenberg was um, you know after Gutenberg had really brought his that's right ah. I think we have a question from from our, our audience. So questions from uh, Lin Linda Kreger. The question is, uh, do these works start with the message or play with the material first? We, sorry, Dan, we, you cut off for a second. Uh, oh. I think I was done. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry, Dan, I thought, I thought it was, I didn't realize it froze. Uh, is Linda addressing that to one or both of us? You. Me? Okay. Uh, well, sure. Um, uh, I mean, I, I think with the letterpress work, um, you know, I kind of explained, uh, hopefully it didn't, I didn't cut out while I was explaining this, but you know, the concept of, there's, a, there's I've always had this conceptual interest in letterpress as a kind of inquiry into the, into technology. Um, now to couple that with the, the content or the, you know, the, the actual texts that I'm printing, um, <laughs> we don't know if you're thinking or if you froze again. No, I've, Am I frozen again? Okay, we you hear did. you now. Yeah, but now you're back. Yeah, you're okay, back. I'm back. I'm back. Well, so the, 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 there, you know, I've also had this, had this conceptual uh, side to, to, in, to in my, my interest in, in the, in the uh, letterpress printing. Um, and then, you know, I had kind of this other thing of like, well, writing political language, uh, addressing certain issues or just uh, or just this like could you go to the strike the three strike posters the three different um, posters using the strike language um, for example here you know I'm I it what, what and these were over as you can see they were do done over different years 
But you know, I've always had this interest in labor, labor history, labor politics, and um, labor action. And uh, so you know, here are three occasions um, where you know I was playing around with um, uh, strike and the rhetoric of strikes, um, the history of that rhetoric. Um, these words in the center, we called a strike and no one came. They, they are not mine. They belong to, it's in the title here, for Freddie Perlman, you know, a, a Detroit radical who, who um, uh, printed um, a, a zine, I guess that's what we would call it, or a pamphlet um, in 1968. And they had this on the cover, we called a strike and no one came. And this was in, this was in um, Kalamazoo and Detroit, Michigan, where at that time, for sure, and all through my growing up in Michigan uh, in the 70s as a kid, you, you heard about strikes all the time. You heard about labor action, militant labor action all the time. Um, so to, so to uh, kind of like bring in this wry way of thinking about um, labor organizing and labor action, um, was always interesting to me, like it, because it, it it says something about. I mean, it's there's there's it's partisan, right? It's about it's about a strike, um, but it's also it's also radical in the sense that it it's a way it's kind of a, it, there's a there's an acknowledgement there that you that labor unions are their own special kind of hell, um, and their own kind of you know their own it's like a, an additional layer of bureaucracy and authority that, you know, one as a worker, you know, has to deal with. Um, so all of those kinds of things are in the language, but then, you know, as on that material level, I was, I was always interested in just seeing where the material would take me um, and force me to alter the language if necessary. Um, so that's a long answer to your question in, in, that in, for the letterpress printing for me and in, in printmaking in general, uh, it's hard to balance. Oh. I'm done. <laughs> oh, uh, could you just repeat the last, the last sentence then? Hard to, hard yeah, to. Uh, just the last sentence is that just for me as a, as a printmaker and uh, when I, in all of the whole realm of analog printing, um, it's it's always been difficult for me to separate or prioritize um, the material versus the message. Uh, they, they, they're, 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 there's a the analog printing was always kind of for me was always kind of the meeting point of those of those two aspects of a work of art. I guess for me, the um, material, like if you really were to explore the material, I don't think that the, uh, in the, like with this method that it, they would look so caricature-ish. Um, there's some where I, do, I try to, uh, you know, let go a little bit, but in general, I was kind of thinking about these, these images that would be that would uh in some way look resemble in flatness or in in um you know lack of perspective it would look like an an older type of image making like uh, uh medieval printing for example um and i didn't necessarily push the the grit the the texture, for example, um, but it's because I, I really wanted to talk about um, this moment of, of speech as uh, violence. Um, like here, this is just a very quickly, this, this particular piece, Steve Madden is, I guess another subtitle would be um, surrogate. Uh, I came to Montreal in 2003 on a bus with a bunch of kind of student protesters from Halifax uh, and took part in a protest against the World Trade Organization. 
it wasn't the most famous um, tear gas battle against the police, Quebec riot <laughs> or protest that happened. Um, but it was uh, in that kind of, that generation of uh, anti-globalization movement that, or anti or alter globalization. Um, and I remember, well, I got arrested along with 400 other people. And um, I remember, but I was in the, the green zone where you're not supposed to be arrested. And the, the stories from downtown where people were still going on the snake march, uh, unpredictably going through different streets in downtown Montreal. Um, the story was that people were breaking windows and I, I seem to recall that Steve Madden was one of the, it's a shoe store and it was, it was one of the, uh, the, the victims. And there was a lot of discussion about whether that is free, a form of expression or, or a form of violence. And um, in, within this show, it is kind of, uh, well, I don't believe personally that it's, it's violence, but the idea that it was sort of like, not exactly the target that maybe um, that best carried the message, like Steve Madden, um, the robber baron of, uh, of course, it's a corporate shoe company, so it has its problems, but it, it, it's, it's like, what is really the message of breaking Steve Madden's windows. I'm not sure. And this is the only, to talk about material, this is the only um, print that you can sort of see from two sides because there's nothing on the other side, whereas a lot of the other prints are, have, a, have a front and, a, and you don't see the other side. But this one you could see from the other side. So you could be either inside or outside of this particular print because the Tyvek is, is a little bit translucent. So we have another question from uh, Farid Jamalov, who asks, uh, how did the artist consider the exhibition space when putting, putting up his work? So I, I guess it's, it's his work, but I guess it, it could be to, well, then you actually shipped the prints to, to us. Uh, but Michael, maybe you could start. How, how did this space influence your presentation of these prints, which are actually mounted on uh, metal tubes used to hide electrical wires. Yeah, I was, I was looking for a metaphor of, of, uh, of an unfinished book, like drying racks. And drying racks are just way too, they're too busy and they're likely expensive. I almost, yeah, I didn't even consider that, even though that was like the, the reference that I wanted. Um, and I found um, just, I, I was looking around the, the this, uh, studio, the residency studios here and saw the conduit and uh, that looked like a good, a good size of, of a tube. Uh, then there's this nylon, I guess, what, just like, you know, backpack strap type of, uh, material. Originally I thought of, of different types of metal strapping or, or something, but I like actually the, uh, the, the, the fashion strap. Um, and it was Velcroed to those straps. And there's, there was something else because there's a, a certain amount of cruelty referenced in other, pe other pieces like the video works or the, the leather sculptures. There was something about it being also subjected somehow. It felt like it was not only on a drying rack but also kind of stretched out and exposed in some way. So um, that's why it came together. And also just how to show prints that are very sculptural in some way in a, in a space 
you know, I didn't want it just on walls, but I didn't want them like flapping around. Um, and I, I also wanted to hide some of the features like this column um, and, and to take advantage of it in, in some way. So it was just like the advantage of, of having a studio here <laughs> where the show was happening, I think um, allowed me to, to kind of navigate toward this one solution, which I was pretty happy with. Um, it, it's uh, imposing and modular. I like the, I like the uh, flayed, the f like the, the flayed effect, right? That like kind of it look, look like they're sort of like skin-like, you know, flayed, sort of mm -hmm. stretched out for. Yeah, there is something skin-like about Tyvek too. Uh, it has a rice paper kind of appearance and it has the fibers in it. And it's also, um, it's not matte really. Um, it has this waxy look. So there is something a little like animal skin, but I mean, that's, that's stretching a little bit. And Dan, I'm curious because we, I'll get back to the picture of the exhibition, but um, we agreed on how the image were presented, but if it was, would, would you have done it differently? Maybe if you had the, because obviously it was not, I should mention that it was not possible for you to come to the Darling Foundry in, because of the pandemic and we had to organize everything from a distance. Um, but is there anything you would have done differently? It seems very interesting to, to me that these, uh, they, I, I feel like they look so clean in a gallery space, you know, compared to, for instance, uh, this image or where they are presented in, in another context. Uh, and there's a, a kind of tension between what is written on these, on these prints and the very kind of uh, neat and peaceful context where, where they are presented. Well, I should say that the, that this presentation is is um, they, it like comes out of a box, so I had you know been printing all of these these things over the years in between other bigger projects. So they're all kind of you know they're all standalone or or maybe just maybe maybe not uh, maybe not um, maybe not enough uh, substance to stand alone to stand alone as you know one print. Um, but I kept printing o over the years and just 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 to see what it would amount to. Um, and uh, in the end, I, I think I printed about, you know, 150 uh, different things. Um, and, you know, a lot of those I, I don't even have even one of, you know, in my possession. Uh, but of what I had, you know, I kind of self-organized into about 80 little over 80 prints and put them all into a box. And that's, that's, you know, that's what we're looking at now. How um, many were there? The uh, boxes? Uh, in, in the box set? No, how many box sets? Were uh, there? R only four so far. I think I, I think <laughs> I, I think I'll probably maybe put together eight all together um, in the end. Um, and, uh, you know, a couple of them have gone into, collections which is kind of nice so so i know where they are uh but uh it's in the box where they're in sleeves they're in four different sleeves and categorized so that's kind of where they're more organized um as a kind of like something you put out on a table and in a library and maybe you know leaf through um putting them putting them on the wall on a wall which i i had you know done in different places um even before organizing them as a box set. Uh, I, you know, they're, they're kind of hard to, uh, um, they're kind of hard to, to put in any sort of like really uh, formally logical way. Um, and uh, to my mind in the end, it's, it's, it's you almost, you, ha you almost have to do what you did here and what I've done before, which is just, <laughs> you know, kind of, throw them all up on a wall and see how they look, you know, all as a whole. Um, and then maybe they become one thing. Uh, but um, ordering them any, in any way is, is difficult. Thank you, Dan. I'm 
I'm thinking we're 10 minutes, uh, we're 10 minutes over. So if there is another question, we might take uh, a last one. Um, otherwise, I guess we are arriving towards the end or maybe if you maybe have a, something you'd like to finish with or um, to say, I'd like to say thank you to, your, to you both. I think it was really lovely to have the chance to see you both and have a conversation uh then you were mentioning that this all our plans have been a little bit uh transformed in th this pandemic context and it has been quite a challenge for for the exhibitions to to continue to exist uh in this context but i think this is a very good way to to some many of the things that are happening and also there's one week left to see it so it's, i thank you a lot for accepting to to do this conversation. Um, yeah, let me just say that I was I was very excited to um, you know show this work in Montreal because of all that I've heard over the years about um, you know the book culture and the uh, kind of zine culture and self publishing kinds of stuff, collage culture that that I've that I've heard of associated with uh, Montreal. So, you know, along with everything else uh, upended by the pandemic, it was, it was kind of, it was disappointing to not be able to go there. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it was fun to engage in, uh, you know, just make use of these platforms that we have. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you, thank you, Michael, for, for, for uh, getting me on board. And um, yeah, I hope we, you and I can uh, maybe continue some conversations. Uh, yeah, we didn't get to the, the the present. <laughs> right. But right. we ran out of time. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, there you go. We can, that's a conversation for everybody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, but no, but okay. before, I can't just say that. What, what do you think uh, we can do right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, I, for me, you just, you just have 30 seconds, right? The priority is, 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 is getting this guy out of the White House, right? We have to do that. And th that, that, that's going to be, it's not as straightforward as, as voting him out. Um, I think we have to, we have to win the Senate because if, if, if winning the Senate means that he, it, should he win or steal the election, then there will be a break on him. Um, the other thing is, if if he if we win the Senate, or if the, you know the Democrats win the Senate back, that'll that'll be incentive for him to leave peacefully, because then he'll know he can't do anything, um, and he'll be investigated if if the Senate goes into Democratic hands. So I, th those are the two things: is to vote him out, but also win the Senate. Okay. And then okay. everything after that is like to resume, right? The whole. I love that you have a clear plan, Dan. <laughs> so, he listens, he listens what do we do now? Pod, you know. He listens to Michael Moore's podcast. He's just <laughs> feeling everything from Michael Moore. <laughs> Michael Moore's from Michigan. Are you from Michigan? I am. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, one of these days, I'll, we'll, we'll, I'll get to Montreal and, and see you both. Yeah, I really hope so. I really, you, you'll definitely be very welcomed. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for staying with us and for being here. Uh, it was lovely and I hope to see you soon at the Fonderie or for another Zoom event. See the show. Yes, one week left, ends on Saturday. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Dan. And have a great evening. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.